Father in heaven, Lord, we just want to come before your throne now to ask that you would speak to our hearts. Lord, we know that no man has wisdom in and of himself sufficient to even speak truth, Lord. But Father, we know that your word tells us in Zechariah 8, 16, speak ye every man the truth to his neighbor. So Father, I just want to pray that as we study your word, you might give us your Holy Spirit. For we learn in the Sabbath school lesson that it is your Holy Spirit that has given the office of giving us and leading us into truth. May that truth truly set us free and free indeed. And may we be drawn nearer to him who is the very embodiment, who is the very image of truth, which is your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for hearing our prayer. May your angels guide our minds. May you also create a hedge about this, about this place where Satan should come and to discourage any mind here today that may need to hear what you would have to say, including myself. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. You, um, I saw the DVD here, um, the DVD, which is the Doug Batchelor one, talking about what's happening in the world today with the Protestant Reformation and the papacy. Now, I heard a quote once that said, we need present truth that deals with present issues. Let me say that again. The quote says, we need present truth that deals and addresses present issues. And so because this is a present issue right now within Christendom, Within, uh, the, uh, within Adventism, I believe that this is something we need to be really, really up to date with. And we need to follow the times, as Jesus said, watch the leaves, because you know the seasons, then you know that the summer draws what? Nine. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at, at something that is relevant, present, and then we're going to ask what truth has Jesus given us for this time to be able to meet the present issues that we're going through. So what I wanted to do is just to read a statement, because this whole issue... Um, there was a video I was going to play, but I decided not to just for the sake of time. But if any of you saw Bishop Tony Palmer's video, who saw that video uh, where he had the speech, I encourage you to go online and check it out. Or well, there's uh, DVDs right here, so nobody can say, I don't have internet. Got that, you know. Um, so uh, in, 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 a, in a nutshell, he said these two statements, and this is what I want to dwell on today, and I really want to break down. Number one, he said, it is, not the, it is the glory of God not doctrine that glues Christians together. Secondly, he said, Luther's protest is over, is yours. So in a nutshell, he's dealing with the Protestant Reformation, and he made a bold statement to say that the Reformation's over. Why do you have Protestant churches anymore? Why do you even exist? And so I wanted to understand this title today, Let There Be Difference, Even What? The reason why I've titled it that is because the question I want us to understand is what caused the, the Reformation in the first place? What was the cause, what was the root that brought about difference in the Christian world from the 5th century all the way up into the 18th, 17th century? What caused it? I want you to hear this quotation. It's found from the book, The Great Controversy, page 125, paragraph 2. Ellen White writes, he, speaking of Luther, firmly declared that Christians should receive no other doctrines than those which rest on the authority of the sacred scriptures. Then it says there, these words struck at the very foundation of papal supremacy. They were the vital principle of the Reformation. In other words, Luther says, in a nutshell, Christians receive no other doctrines except those which are based upon the Bible and the Bible alone. Hence, they came up with the statement, Sola, finish it. Scriptura, the Bible and the Bible alone. And because Rome is based upon church and, uh, sorry, upon scripture, partly, and tradition, they could not have that. So you have one group that says scripture alone, no church tradition. You have another group that says, no, we have church tradition and scripture. And that's what caused difference. Does that make sense? Now, in understanding this, I want you to go to the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3. Does doctrine have any part in the work of salvation or of the work of Christ in our lives? 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read verses 15 and 17. Say amen when you're there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. 
where does doctrine derive from and what benefit does it bring to us? Because if it caused a difference, there must be something important that, the, that Luther and many of the reformers saw in doctrine that was necessary to be held onto and, and therefore even at the sake of a difference happening. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, are we there? The Bible says in verse 15, and that thou hast known from, from, from a child the holy scriptures. Notice what it says there, which are what? Able to make thee wise unto what? Salvation through faith, which is where? In Christ Jesus. So the scriptures have the ability or the office work of making us wise unto what? Salvation. And Jesus said, uh, the Bible says, speaking of Jesus, um, in Matthew 1, 21, speaking of his birth, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. So the work of salvation would be delineated or shown us in the Bible, and the Bible would be a tool for God to make us wise unto salvation from what? Sin. Now read verse 16. Verse 16 says, all scripture is given by what? Inspiration of God and is profitable. What does that mean? It means you can get something out of it. You can get a benefit from it, from scripture. It says all scripture is profitable for doctrine. What did it say? Doctrine. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So does the Bible make it clear that scripture profits us in even doctrine? Yes. But scripture is also able to make us what? Wise unto salvation. So the source that makes us wise into salvation also teaches us doctrine. Now notice what happens in verse 17. There is a practical reason why we have scripture, why we have doctrine, and how it is to be brought not just into knowledge, but even into experience. Read verse 17. That the man of God may be what? Perfect, thoroughly finished unto good words, Good works thoroughly furnished unto good works that's action that's living out what you have learned in your knowledge and putting it into practice amen? amen so the scriptures not only do they give us wisdom unto salvation they make us they also profit us for doctrine but as the Sabbath school taught when we have this knowledge it becomes a part of our experience unto good works that's why Alan White writes in selected messages Volume 1, Book 1, page 20, the Bible was given for practical purposes. Practical. That means that what comes into the knowledge must come into the life. So in other words, what you understand will affect how you live. That's why Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So there is an effect that what we understand about the scriptures will have an effect of the life we live. Now, Jesus said there, and remember what Jesus said, speaking of doctrine. Because here, one, here, Tony Palmer is saying we should have unity regardless of doctrine. But notice what the Bible says in John 5.39. Jesus says here, search the scriptures. The scriptures is what we just read about, profitable for doctrine. Also to take our knowledge, which will make us wise unto being saved, and put it into practice in our life and good works. Amen? And then we now see in John 5, 39, Jesus says, speaking of these very scriptures from which we get doctrine, search the scriptures. For in them you think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of who? Of me. So can you have Jesus without the scriptures? No. Because the scriptures testify of who? Jesus. So this will make sense that if scriptures point to who? Jesus and the scriptures are profitable for doctrine that would make that would mean that Christ would have to be the center of what doctrine there is a movement in our church that is saying I only preach love I don't preach doctrine I only preach the love of Christ we don't preach doctrine brothers and sisters doctrine should make Christ the center this is why Alan White writes in Testimonies to the Church, Volume 6, page 53, paragraph 3. Every true doctrine makes Christ the center. Because Scripture is about Christ. And Scripture is where we draw our doctrine. So to have Jesus and shun doctrine, that is because people have the wrong idea of doctrine. 
Doctrine is, should never be separated from Christ. Amen? Amen? It should be centered in Christ. Even health, even the health message. That's why we're told that health principles and counsels and diets and foods should never be separated from the third angel's message. So every dynamic, everything we teach should be in the light of Christ and his work for salvation. Are we following? Amen. Amen. Now, who remembers the apostles when they were prisoned? The Bible says in Acts 5, 27, 28, it says, And when they had, and by the way, I just have to throw some scriptures out just for sake of time. But we're going to, I'll point you to the ones we're going to go to. But in Acts 5, 28, the apostles had been put in prison. Then the angel of the Lord came and pulled them out and said, Go into the temple and speak the words of life. And in Acts 5, 27, when they were brought before the council, notice their mindset about doctrine. And notice what these, the, the council accused them of. Acts 5.27 And when they had brought them, the apostles, they set them before the council. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in his name? Whose name do you think they were teaching in? Jesus. The name of Jesus. But listen to the second accusation. It says there, it says, And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. Let me say that again. Here they've been accused of teaching in the name of who? Jesus. Then they're accused of filling the land with what? Doctrine. Why? Because scripture testifies of who? Jesus. And scripture is the source from which we gather our doctrine. Therefore, it makes sense. If you're preaching in the name of Christ, you should be preaching doctrine in the context of understanding the love of Christ. This is why it's not enough just to eat healthy without love for Jesus. That's why it's not enough to dress up wonderful on Sabbath and in our heart we just do it for the sake of self-righteousness. Everything we do, every doctrine, tithe, health, you name it, Christian behavior, marriage should be centered around Christ, our righteousness. You don't just be healthy and become a healthy, wicked individual. And we know, and, and, and those that are involved in medical missionary know that the work of medical missionary work is not only, as Ministry of Healing says in the first chapter, to bring health, life, and peace, but perfection of character. It's intertwined. So doctrine here is centered in Christ. So how can you have Christ without his doctrines? Now notice what we read here. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews 5. I'm going to read something in verse 12 to 14. Are we following so far? Amen. Let me see your hand if you're following. Amen. Because I heard a few voices. <laughs> Hebrews 5, verses 12 to 14. Notice one of the impacts we find here in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14. Are we there? The Bible says, Therefore, when for the time ye ought to be what? Teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and have become such as have need of milk, and not of what? Strong meat. Verse 13. For everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a what? Is a babe. Verse 16, uh, 14. But strong meat belongs to them that are of what? Full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and what? Evil. Now is, is the writer of Hebrews speaking about eating meat and eating, drinking milk? Literally? The reason why we know this is go to Hebrews chapter 6 and read verse 1. Are we there? Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of what? Hebrews 6, 1. Let me say that again. Therefore, leaving the principles of the what? Doctrine of Christ. Let us go on unto what? Perfection. Read verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. So meat and milk, the writer of Hebrews is speaking of what? doctrine and here he's saying in verse 12 for when the time you should be what teaches you are what babes so in other words he's saying you have had 20 30 40 years and you're still a spiritual babe and the issue is in verse 14 but strongly belongs to them that are of full age even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to do what discern both good and evil so those who have 
a bunch of knowledge, but they don't exercise it. They remain what? Babes. Babes. But meat is those who take that and they use it. And then they are able to discern between both what? Good and evil. Good and evil what? Good doctrine and bad doctrine. Why? And that tells us that what we believe and our understanding affects how we grow as a Christian. That's why the, the Luther and these, 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 these reformers were so adamant, don't touch the doctrine. Because what I believe, the life is molded by the faith. There are many Christians say, it doesn't matter what you believe, as long as you believe in Jesus. But in Romans chapter 8 verse 29 says that whom God predestinated, he conformed, he, he, he has conf a desire to be conformed to the image of his son. So there is a growth that God wants in his people. And so to say we don't need doctrine is to remove that very thing that can provide the spiritual nourishment for you to grow. You take food away from a baby, how's it going to live and grow to become an adult? You take doctrine from his people, how are they going to become into the fullness of the stature of Christ? That's what Ephesians 4.12 tells us. The church should be doing to promote that. Are we following? Now, I want you to see this. Who inspired the doctrines of the Bible? Go to 2 Peter chapter 1. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to read verses 9, uh, 20 and 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Notice what the Bible shows us here. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Say amen when you're there. Amen. amen. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. Knowing this first, that no prophecy is of what? Of the scripture is of any private interpretation for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake, how? As they were moved by what? The Holy Spirit. So the agent that was used to inspire scripture, and also scripture being the source from which we get doctrine, was inspired by who? Holy Spirit. Now, go to the book of John chapter 16. John 16. Now that we see now that this scripture written and that which Luther, Hus, Jerome, Zwingli and the whole lot based their faith on. This was inspired not just by men, but by who? By the Holy Spirit. So that which they're basing their, their, their trust on is something that comes from divinity, not just from humanity. And notice what we read here in John chapter 16. Jesus, therefore, promised. Notice why Jesus, therefore, gives them an unction. John 16, verse 13. Are we there? The Bible says here, Jesus speaking about in the context of those who will come and kill, thinking they're doing God's service. Then Jesus says, I'm going away and I'm going to send what? The Holy Spirit. Now notice the office of the Holy Spirit in John 16, 13. Are we there? The Bible says there, how be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will do what? Guide you into what? Oh, truth. truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever things he shall hear, that shall he what? Speak. And he, sh and he shall what? Show you things to come. And verse 14. He shall glorify who? He shall receive the things of who? Of mine. And give it unto you. So was the Holy Spirit promised as the tool to lead the minds of men to truth? Yes. Because truth is what we find in the scriptures. And scriptures is what makes an individual wise unto what? Salvation. Now notice this. If the Holy Spirit comes to bring you truth. And the Holy Spirit was the one who inspired written truth. Would the Holy Spirit come and contradict this? Why? Because he inspired this. So when the Holy Spirit comes to the minds of men, it doesn't make sense that the Holy Spirit would contradict the very scriptures he, he inspired. Are we following? If you wrote a book about a subject, and then you came and you came to present something, and you presented something completely contradicting to the book you just wrote, that wouldn't make sense. So when the Holy Spirit was going to come after Jesus would come, he would come down not to lead men into half-truth, but complete truth. 
And that truth is in the Bible. So do we now see that when the Holy Spirit comes, He does not contradict that which He has already inspired in the Bible? Now go to John chapter 17. There's a reason why I brought this up, because in John 17, notice something here. The Reformation, one of the causes of it was that they said, we will accept sola scriptura, because the Bible and the Bible alone. Because the scriptures make us wise unto salvation, and they also contain our guide to live like Jesus. But then you had a system that says, no way, leave it alone, follow half of us, and some of that. And so there was a what? A difference. And the message that we're speaking to today is, let there be difference, even more. Let there be difference, even what? War. Now notice what Jesus prayed for in John 17. And by the way, if you haven't watched the video, this is the video. This is the text in which Tony Palmer uses in his video to, to try to establish that let's all come together and let's just be united and let's put doctrine aside. Jesus will fix doctrine in heaven. But we're going to see some very solemn things about this that could slip us up if we're not grounded. John 17, are we there? Verse 17, remember Jesus has just prayed for, that he, he's just told them that he will send them the what? The Holy Spirit. And the Spirit will do what? Lead them into truth. Now notice what truth is according to Scripture. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. What does it say? Thy word is truth. So the Holy Spirit would come down and lead them into truth, but truth concerning what? The word. The word. So the Holy Spirit wouldn't come down even in 2014 and lead a group of people to come together while contradicting the very book he wrote. Because he inspired the book, so how can he come and contradict the book? 1 John chapter 2, verse 21 tells us, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know the truth, and that no lie is of the truth. So the Holy Spirit's not going to give truth in Scripture, then come down and give lies. Because he is only holy truth. So we see an order here. Number one, there's a difference caused in the Reformation. Scripture and doctrines of the Bible. Doctrines of men and tradition and some of the Bible. So there's a what? Difference. And the reason why this is, is because doctrine is what we have in knowledge to show us the way of salvation, but also through the work of the Holy Spirit riding on our hearts, helps us live out that work that God wants to do in our life. And then we have a split there. And we see that the way in which God would lead us to understand doctrine would be through who? who? The Holy Spirit. Why the Holy Spirit? Because He was the one who inspired the what? The Bible. So it makes sense that God would give us the very person who inspired the book we need to understand. So God would send the Holy Spirit and we would receive it. And therefore, now Jesus prays for what? Sanctification. Why? Because 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. So God now has a desire for His people. Now this is very interesting. How is one sanctified by the truth? Acts chapter 26 verse 18 says that, we, that there are some that are sanctified by faith. Sanctified, set apart for holy use. That's why 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 9, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. So we see that one way that God would sanct have His people sanctified is through faith. But notice the other one. Go to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, reading verses 22. Verse 22. 1 Peter 1, reading verse 22. Notice what the Word of God tells us. 1 Peter 1, reading verse 22. One of the great ways that the Holy Spirit will work is not only to lead our minds to understand truth, but He will also lead us to do something else. I want to ask you a question. Is the, is the Holy Spirit, according to the Bible, given to those that disobey God? Who would say yes? What does the Bible say? Acts chapter 5 verse 32. The Holy Spirit whom God has given to them that what? Obey Him. The Holy Spirit does not come down to ascend upon a people to bring unity in a group of people that want to disobey. Because the Holy Spirit never works in such a manner. He leads to truth. 
And whether we're ignorant of that, or we just don't know, or we're, we're rejecting that, the Holy Spirit wants to lead us to truth. But notice what else the Holy Spirit also wants us to be led to. 1 Peter 1, 22. Are we there? Are we there? The Bible says there, Seeing ye have done what? Purified your souls. How? And obeying the truth. That word, purify, is another word for sanctify. Changed. Purified, made holy through obedience to the truth. That's why it's first faith and then righteousness by faith. Because no man can do obedience without Christ. And without the indwelling power of what? The Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit now comes down to a believer or someone who is converted, they understand truth. But then the Holy Spirit, because it's only given to those who obey truth, it requires and empowers us to obey the very thing He's just showed us. He will show us the Sabbath is the truth. Therefore, we think, oh, what am I going to do? Obey it or reject it? Then the Holy Spirit says, your job is to be faithful. Obey the Sabbath. So the Holy Spirit shows us truth. Then the Holy Spirit leads us and, and to obey that truth. Not to contradict it. And the Bible says that you will purify your souls. How? By obedience to the truth. That's why Alan White writes in Great Controversy, page 608. I have seen, uh, before the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but who were not sanctified by obedience to the truth. They will abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. How? By uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in the same light remember if you don't follow in the ways and, and and growing from spiritual milk to meat you will not be discerning good and evil so you know there are many adventists who are not switched on who will be deceived by that video because they're not studying the bible that man speaks with such persuasion and such a calm manner that many people who don't know the bible would say surely that man is a man of god but for those who are spiritual minded, they say Isaiah chapter 8 verse 20 to the law and to the testament. If they speak not according to this world, finish it with me. There's no light in them. The Holy Spirit is brought about to bring an experience in the lives of God's people where they're obedient to the truth. Where they don't disobey. Now notice the order here that Jesus prayed for. Go back to John 17. John 17, John chapter 17. Notice this order that Jesus prayed for in John chapter 17. Are we there? John 17. We're reading verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified how? Through the truth. Neither I pray for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me. How? Through their word. So the believers in the time of Christ were to receive truth and to obey that truth and even future believers from the time of Christ even up until the second coming would have to be individuals who would become disciples through the word. Not through tradition. Not through what we call the doctrines of man. It says, neither I pray for these alone but for them which shall believe future. Verse 21, that they all may be what? One. One. Now, if you heard that video from Tony Palmer, this is exactly the text he read. That they all may be one. But brothers and sisters, we saw that before there is unity, there's sanctification through the truth. And before there is sanctification in the, through the truth, through the work of the Holy Spirit in our heart, there is a leading to the truth by the Holy Spirit. Are we following? Before there is a unity, there is a sanctification in the truth. And before there is a sanctification of obeying that truth, I first must be led to see that truth. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So there is an order. The Holy Spirit comes to the believer, shows him truth. Then he calls him to obey that truth through the power of the indwelling Christ or through the Holy Spirit's power. Therefore, as he obeys that, he's sanctified through it. Therefore, because individual believers are being sanctified through truth, there will be a unity in truth. Don't miss the order. Holy Spirit leads to truth because He inspired truth. Then He leads us to obey that truth and through an understanding of knowledge 
and experience, there will be a unity in truth. This is very important. Go to the book of Psalms, chapter 115. Psalms 115, we're reading verse 1. If you have not read the book, Great Controversy, I would challenge you and encourage you, get that book and read it. Psalms chapter 115, verse 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 115, verse 1. And as you go there, I want you to hear the statement. Psalms chapter 115, verse 1. We're told in Review and Herald, August 27, 1901, paragraph 3. True inspiration never rejects true inspiration but is in harmony with the Bible. Anything that leads away from the Word of God is, to be, is proved to be inspired from beneath. Why? Because if, the, if, if an individual says, the Holy Spirit has inspired me, that I need to go to church on Sunday. That I need to go and marry a non-Adventist, even though we're told that to marry a non-Adventist is to marry an unbeliever. Do you see what I mean? And a Christian can say, I've been inspired by the Holy Spirit to go and witness to this girl who's not Adventist and be in a relationship with her and win her to Christ. The Holy Spirit never convicts you to do something that contradicts what he said. So if inspiration comes to the mind of a man, of a pope, of a leader that contradicts that from the Bible, it's not the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, so how can an inspiration in your mind contradict the Bible if it's from the same source? Can't. Notice Psalm 115. This is a key problem that we find even in the church. Psalm 115, are we there? Verse 1, the Bible says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto what? Thy name give what? Glory for what? Thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So is a giving of glory to the name of God connected with truth? Yes. yes. Let me say that again. A, a giving of glory to God is connected with truth. Yes. Listen to the statement. Great controversy, we're told. Great controversy. Page 597, paragraph 2. Write this down. We were just told, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name, give what? Give glory for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. So the glory that Jesus prayed that would be bestowed on his people would be some, a glory that comes from what? Truth. Alan White writes in Great Controversy 597, paragraph 2, the truth and the glory of God are inseparable. It is impossible for us with the Bible within our reach to honor God by erroneous opinions. Am I saying that those who are following error and are not in complete truth are lost? No. But what I'm saying is that even though there are individuals who are living in error and they're Christians and they're worshiping Sunday and they're following wrong doctrine, I'm not saying they're lost. But what I'm saying is sincerity is never a replacement for sound doctrine. Just because you're sincere, we can be all so sincere. But Genesis chapter 20, verse 6 to 9, when God said to Abimelech, I know that you have done this in the integrity of your heart, but now restore his wife. God acknowledges when we're ignorant, but he seeks to restore us onto the right path. But what I'm trying to get at is that you cannot give glory to God from a source that is error. You can be also sincere and say, I give glory to God by keeping Sunday, but that's not based on Scripture, therefore it can't give glory to God. That doctrine leads from Scripture, and how we live is what will be represented in good works and our life, and that's what will give glory. By the way, what is the glory of God? Speak to me. It's character. Where would we find that in Scripture? Exodus chapter 33 Verse 18, Moses said unto the Lord, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he says, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. I will proclaim the name of the Lord. I will be just unto whom I will be just and merciful and so forth. So we see that the character of God is what? His glory. That's why faith I live by, page 84, paragraph 2. Spirit of prophecy says that when Moses said, show me thy glory, he was showing God's character. 
So the glory, in other words, is connected to truth. Therefore, when there is a unity of the body of Christ, there can never be a unity and glory in error. There can be no unity on error in the body of Christ. Because how can Jesus be the head of truth and have a body of error? He can't. Jesus can't be the head of truth. Jesus said in John chapter 14 verse 6, I am the truth. So how could you have a head of truth and a church of a body in error? Because the head controls what? The body. And the head is where the brain and the mind resides. And Jesus is truth. So Jesus would communicate to his body actions of truth. He would not tell the body to do error. To go and hurt itself and punch itself and destroy itself. Jesus being the head would lead the body to practice truth. Amen. So how can you have a body united in error and truth and a head of truth? Doesn't make sense. No lie is of the truth. So Jesus is the truth. How can he have a body in error? He can't. You can't have a body in error. The truth is God's word. You know, there are many times today we'll say, let's make hip-hop gospel give glory to God. Let's make all these types of entertainment gospel to give glory to God. The only gospel that gives glory to God is the gospel that is based on truth. Anything that is not from Scripture, whether from thus saith the Lord or in principle, cannot give glory to God. Truth is connected to glory. Are we following? Should we not sell the truth to obtain unity anyway? Go back to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. We're going to finish off the statement as Jesus prayed for. John chapter 17. Please don't, please follow me. Please don't let, yeah, let's make sure we, 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 we reach the end of this presentation. Amen. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, together saith the Lord. I want us to really reason and think about what we're hearing today. First, we read that there was a split in the Reformation. Why? Because truth is what we stand on, not tradition. And the Reformers said, we will go by the Bible, the Bible alone. Then you had a system said, no, we will go by the Bible and tradition. So they said, let there be difference, even more. The Reformers said, let there be difference. Martin Luther stood before them and he said, I cannot and I will not retract. It is neither right nor safe to go against one's conscience. To do so is neither right nor safe. He says, I cannot and I will not retract, so help me God. Luther said, let there be difference, even more. John 17, are we there? John 17. Friends, we've come to a time where we need to be grounded in truth. <laughs> Psalms chapter 19, verse 11 uh, 119 11 thy word have I hid in mine heart who who hid the word in the heart from that verse David did so when John 14 26 says but the comforter which is the Holy Ghost the father shall send and he shall bring to your remembrance all things whatsoever I have said to you how can the Holy Spirit bring to your mind something you never made efforts to put there let me say that again how can we expect the Holy Spirit to bring to our mind Truth, we never make effort to put there. Because the time of trouble was coming. As Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. And that time of trouble, such as never was, even from when there was a nation, to that same time. But the God's people will be delivered. John 17, are we there? John 17, we're finishing off the prayer of Jesus. He says that they, in verse 21, that they may all be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast what? Amen. Sent me. Amen. This is exactly what we heard on the video of Bishop Tony Palmer saying, we need unity, we need the visible unity, but brothers and sisters, you can never have unity without the Holy Spirit and truth. You can be united in error, but that's not the unity for which Jesus prayed. 
Before he promised unity, he prayed for sanctification through truth. Whether you're a babe or you're an adult in Christ. So whether you have people that are newly converted, amen. They, they only know that much, so Christ expects that much. You have those who have been here for a long time, God expects more. But in other words, whether you're a babe in Christ or you're an adult in Christ, both should be unified because both have been led to truth, both are obeying the truth they know, and both will be united in truth. That's how unity is to be affected, not through error. John 17, we read here, it says, verse 22, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be what? One. How? Even as we are one. We saw that glory can never be separated from what? Truth. So when Jesus says, The glory which thou gavest me, I give who? Them. Jesus would never give glory. On a unity or on a unity of people that is not based on truth. How can it? Because Psalm 115 verse 1. Glory is based on truth. You cannot give glory from error. Glory can only be given from truth. Jesus being truth, he gives them glory. So therefore, when Jesus prayed for unity, he was not praying and saying, let's just get all the Christians together and let's come together and forget doctrine. Because then you have a unity on compromise. And notice why there's a difference. Remember when Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 10, 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I am come not to send peace, but a sword. Verse 35, For I have come to set a man at variance against his father, and a, mother, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Verse 36 of Matthew 10, and, the, and, the, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. Jesus says, The truth that I come, it will cause a severing effect. It will cause a severing effect. Because you've got either those who are righteous or wicked. Those who are like Cain or Abel. Those who are like Isaac or Esau, uh, Jacob or Esau. Those who accept the blessings of Christ and those who reject them. Jesus says there will be two groups of people, the world and his people. Still the end of time. That's why we have a harvest. Wheat, tears, sheep, goat. Ripe for death, ripe for everlasting life. There is two groups. So there is always going to be a difference. And especially in Christianity. Because the Son of Man came to bring truth and to set men free. If you're following, say Amen. 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 As we finish our final few verses, go to the book of Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs chapter 23. We're going to read Proverbs chapter 23. And as we go there, I, want to, I want, really want you to, to think of these three statements. Number one, the Reformation was caused through an issue of people wanting to force others to accept unscriptural doctrine. But the, the, the mindset of the reformers was the scriptures and the scriptures alone. Then there was a difference that said, but Jesus therefore told us that doctrine was inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit therefore Jesus said when he leaves earth, he will send who? The Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible, therefore the Holy Spirit would lead us back to understand the Bible. Then we saw that in, in leading us to truth, Jesus prayed that we might be sanctified through truth. And that sanctification would come through faith, Acts 26, 18, but also obeying what the Holy Spirit shows us. And then through that experience, Jesus prayed for His glory to be upon them and that they may all be what? One. See, it makes sense that if the believers are led by the Holy Spirit into truth, whatever that is, the Sabbath, diet, health reform, lifestyle changes, if the Holy Spirit leads the people into truth and then they obey that truth, according to the Bible, truth is given, uh, uh, glory is based on what? Truth. So if the believers come together, they're, they're showing truth, they obey that truth, Jesus therefore can put his blessing of his glory on them. Because they're living in what? Truth. And truth is what? The source of glory. 
So then Jesus can now pray for his people that as, they, as this person gets convicted of the Sabbath and this person gets convicted of health reform and this person gets convicted that I must pay tithe and this person gets convicted that there is a God here and so forth and that the Bible and even if this person gets convicted that, that Alan White's writings are the source of prophecy, uh, spirit of prophecy for this church. When the believers all around come to the knowledge of truth and everybody comes to that, that belief and they obey that, then there's a unity. And this is the unity for which Christ prayed. But we're in the book of Proverbs 23. Are we there? Therefore, Jesus says, I want them to be one as me and the Father are one. But that tells us that the unity that Jesus and the Father have is complete. There's no error. So Jesus prays for a unity of his people on truth. Not on compromise. Proverbs 23, 23, we there? Bible says, buy the truth and what? Sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. Does the Bible tell us to sell truth there? What does it say? No. Buy it and do what? Sell it, sell it not. So are we to sell truth for unity? With something that Revelation chapter 13, Daniel chapter 7, Revelation chapter 17 has clearly told us is of the devil. A system controlled by who? The dragon gave him. His seat and power and great authority. So how can you have unity with the powers of darkness? We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? The, the answer is implied in the question, none. There can be no unity on error. This is why we find that this video and this message that is going to the world is not from above. It cannot be from above. How can Jesus commission a unity, a unification of people based upon error and based upon doctrines that contradict what he said? Jesus could never commission such unity. Jesus only commissions that unity which comes based on the Bible. And this is why it's important. If we don't understand our Bibles, we're going to be swept away. If we spend more time watching movies and listening to the music of the world and spending more time staying up late to watch sport, and we wouldn't dare spend that time in prayer, and we are not fixing the word of Jesus in our mind, how can we be sing songs like Jesus is coming again and yet fail in preparation? Manuscript releases book 20, page 64, paragraph 4. Alan White writes, The time will come when many will be deprived of the written word. But if this word is printed in the memory, no one can take it from us. It will be a talisman that will, that will meet the worst efforts of evil. Brothers and sisters, we're going to finish in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. Deuteronomy chapter 20. We're going to see a principle of war. Actually, this will be our second to last verse. Deuteronomy 20. As we go there, I want to read a statement. Our high calling 329. Jesus prayed that his followers might be one. We're going to Deuteronomy 20, verses 10 to 12. But we're told in... in um, our High Calling 329, Jesus prayed that his followers might be one, but we are not to sacrifice the truth in order to secure this union. For we are to be sanctified through the truth. Here is the foundation of all true peace. Men would try to affect unity through concession to popular opinion, through compromise with the word, and sacrifice of vital godliness. But truth is God's basis for the unity of his people. The wide diversity of belief in the Protestant churches is regarded by many as decisive proof that no effort to secure a forced uniformity can ever be made. People are saying there's no way that the evangelicals will go over to the Catholics. There's no way that the Methodists or the Lutherans would do it. They already did it. 1999, they signed that agreement. 
unity on common doctrine. Not the evangelicals, but the Methodists and the Lutherans. That's why they had a picture in one of the German magazines with Luther saying sorry to the Pope. It says here, There has been for years in churches of the Protestant faith a strong and growing sentiment in favor of a union based upon common points of doctrine. To secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be from a Bible standpoint, must necessarily be waived. In order to affect this union that they're calling for, they're going to have to put away all the doctrinal differences. Why? Because there can be no unity in that. The only way to get unity without truth is to have error. And many of these people want this because they don't want to annoy people. And brothers and sisters, do you know it's even coming into the minds of Adventists to say, oh, we preach love, we don't preach doctrine. That's foolish. If we say that we are going in line with Rome, to say, oh, let's just preach the love of Christ. But we saw Scripture should be centered in Christ. So how can you preach the love of God as delineated in the Bible and separate it from Christ? You can't. Scripture must be given in the context of understanding the love of Christ. This is very sad. You know, when I saw this video, I thought of ministers that I have heard, even from friends, that are saying the exact same thing. There are ministers, even in our pulpit, saying, we preach love, we don't touch doctrine. That's why you have young people that come to church for entertainment, not for the gospel. There are churches where young people have no interest in the Bible. Come to church, couldn't care less. On phones, texting, in the presence of a holy God. Because our church is following the mindset. Many, I'm not saying all, many are following this mindset. They think you have to hype the young people up to secure truth. They think you need to hide the young people up, bring multitudes in, but all you do is bring in unconverted hearts that are going to be a distraction to the truth. God says truth is my basis for unity. Let's bring hip-hop gospel and rock gospel and let's not preach prophecy and don't preach the three angels' messages because that's too harsh. That's foolishness. Let's not preach this because the young people are going to up and leave. So be it. If it means that they go home from war and they come back with a full heart, so be it. Let us not follow the ways of the world. Let us not compromise with it. Let us, brothers and sisters, there are young people that are willing to hear truth. Because John chapter 8 verse 32, it is only truth that makes you free. And 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 12, we are called to be established in present truth. What is present truth? Early writings, page 63. Present truth is the sanctuary message in connection with the 2,300 days. The commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That's present truth. And this is why we need to be educated. Deuteronomy 20, are we there? Deuteronomy chapter 20. The Bible says there, we're going to read verse 10 to 12. Speaking of the laws of warfare, when Israel would go to war, there was only two options, peace or war. Deuteronomy 20 verse 10, When thou comest nigh unto a city to what? Fight against it, then proclaim peace unto it. And it shall be, if it make thee answer of peace, and open up unto thee, then it shall be that all the people that is found therein shall be tributaries unto thee, and they shall serve thee. And if it will make no what? Peace with thee, but will make war war against thee, then thou shalt besiege it. One of the only alternatives to peace was war. The only alternative that came when Israel would go and conquer a nation was war. If that nation that they went to go and conquer and to proclaim peace unto, if they pro promoted peace and that country said, no peace with you, difference, then they said, there will be war. And that's why, I, that's why I've called this message today. Let there be difference, even more. Amen. Let there be difference, even more. We're going to finish in Psalm 119. 
Psalm 119, this is our final passage that we're going to read. Psalm 119, verse 126. Psalm 119, verse 126. Brothers and sisters, I have seen young people give their lives to Jesus through accepting the three angels' messages. I've seen young people come from the world, come from smoking pot, doing drugs, doing all these things to come and give their life to Christ. Young people especially, I want you to think, where is your time we're spending more time in the games and in fashion and obedience to fashion and worrying about what's the next high time kicks that come and I can, that I can get them or where can I spend my money or which friends can I look? Brothers and sisters, that is all temporary. We need to put the kingdom of God first in our life. Amen. If we're spending more time in video games, put that away. Study God's word. If we're spending more time reading novels or fiction, put that away. Pick up the books of the spirit of prophecy. If we're spending more time just trying to be like the world and trying to get the fashions of the world, study Alan White's writings and, and the Bible and see what constitutes humility and modesty. See what God would have us to think because brothers and sisters, we are on the borders of Canaan. Are we going to be like Joshua and Caleb and say, let us go and possess the land? Or are we going to be like the other ten spies and say, oh, let's just chill. Those that chill are going to be those who get left on the borders of eternity. We want to enter those gates of eternity. Psalm 119, are we there? Psalm 119, are we there? Amen. Verse 126, final passage. Psalm 119, 126, the Bible says there, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. Therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above the gold. Therefore I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. It is time for the Lord to work. For the world is making void God's truth and hence God's law. Because Psalm 119, 142 says, Thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and thy law is the truth. So the, so the world is sacrificing truth, yea, God's law, for unity. And the Bible says, David prayed, it is time for you, Lord, to work. For they have made void your law, your truth, your word, everything that Christ was sacrificed for. They are putting, Martin Luther said this, Cursed be that unity for whose sake the word of God is put to stake. Let me say that again. Luther said, Cursed be that unity that, that is, that, uh, for whose sake the word of God is put to stake. In other words, he's saying, Any unity that is a unity based on error, let that be a curse. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah 17 verse 5, Cursed be the man that puts his trust in man and makes flesh his arm, and whose heart departs from the Lord. If we have a unity throughout Christendom, coming from the words and the, the so-called logic and wisdom of men, let that be a curse. Because no man has wisdom, spiritual things, spiritually discerned. That's why we need the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For their foolishness unto him. They're spiritually discerned. And in closing, I want you to hear the statement. Final statement. Great Controversy, page 45, paragraph 3. Great Controversy, page 45, paragraph 3. After a long and severe conflict, the faithful few decided to dissolve all union with the apostate church if she still refused to free herself from falsehood and idolatry. Now, this is not talking about leaving the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is talking about Rome in the times of the Reformation. They had become corrupt. They accepted unscriptural doctrines. And therefore, these people said, let us separate. They saw that separation was an absolute necessity if they would obey the word of God. They dared not tolerate errors fatal to their own souls and set an example which would imperil the faith of their children and children's children. To secure peace and unity, they were ready to make any concession consistent with fidelity to God, but they felt that even peace would be too dearly purchased at the sacrifice of principle. 
If unity could be secured, this is the statement that finishes this, if unity could be secured only by the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference. And even more. Let there be difference. And even more. Let there be difference. And even more. Are we willing to stand truthful to God's ways? Because brothers and sisters, we are called to be intellectually and spiritually grounded in the truth. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children, tossed to and fro, being carried about with every wind of doctrine. The Bible says that, that some can, children that are still milk and who remain in ignorance are those in the sense of being carried away by doctrine. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith and give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. So if we're going to join a unity that says, don't worry about doctrine and let's just be united, how can we join that knowing that Paul and the apostles warned that in the last days there will be some who would depart from faith through doctrines? So if we say, regardless of doctrine, let's be united, how do we know we're not departing from the faith and being led by doctrines of devils? The Word of God is our standard of righteousness. No error can take the place of that. Three points today. Number one, God would give the Holy Spirit to lead us into truth. Whether it's God's law, whether it's God's word, whether it's even the gift of tongues, whether it's the Sabbath. Every truth that we have learned has come as a result of the work of who? The Holy Spirit. Then the, 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 the Holy Spirit would lead us to that truth and call us to do what? Just look at it, obey it. Then as we obey that, we will be purified, sanctified through faith and obedience in the truth. And that would bring about an experience individually in each believer. Then Jesus could put his glory on them and bring about unity. So three things. Holy Spirit leads us to truth. The Holy Spirit calls us and empowers us to obey that truth and to be sanctified and changed through that experience. And then the glory of God is what will unite us in truth. That's how unity is to be affected in God's church. Never through error. Only through truth. And I want to make a short appeal to you. Messages to Young People, page 80, paragraph 2. Death before dishonor or transgression of God's law should be the motto of every Christian. Death before dishonor. And you know what I've been asking myself? Am I willing to even go to death for the truth? And there's no way a man can even give his life for Christ. Rightfully, without the Holy Spirit and without that power. I want to ask you today, if it's your desire to say, Lord, what is truth? Because brothers and sisters, if we are not founded and we, and we hear words coming from the dragon and we don't understand truth, we are going to be swept away. If you, if we don't, if, there are many Christians who are looking at Bishop Tony Palmer and they're saying, that sounds wonderful. But that's because they've been swept away by winds of doctrine, by doctrines of devils. But God says, put my word in your mind so that when you come before kings and rulers for my name's sake, the Holy Spirit shall come to you and bring to your mind that which through devotion, through Bible study, through witnessing, you have imprinted in your mind. And if that's your desire, I want to ask you to stand with me as I say, as we, as we, as I say a short prayer. If that's your desire, Lord, I want to stand Death before dishonor. Truth before error. And to make that commitment, Lord, let there be difference even more. That's a serious, that's a serious statement. Let there be difference even more. 
And I want to remind you, as we make this stand for God, Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 5 says, Better is it that thou shouldest not vow, than that you do make a vow and you don't pay. Do you know it's better that we don't stand today, if we're not going to stand for that vow, than if we do stand and don't stand for that vow. And I want to just encourage you as well, that as we stand, and brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, I make that commitment with you. Because man, I am, I've seen all this stuff happening, I realize, man, I am not ready for what is coming on the scene. But by God's grace, all His biddings, finish it with me, are in Abraham's. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your truth that makes us free. Lord, I thank you so much that you've called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. Father, I know that no man is worthy, Lord, of the work of the gift of salvation and even to participate in the preaching and the proclamation of salvation. But Lord, we come before you broken vessels, seeking renewal. We come before you praying the prayer, take our hearts for we cannot give them. It is thy property, keep our hearts pure, for we cannot keep our hearts pure for thee. Save us in spite of ourselves, our weak, unchristlike selves. Father, I just pray that, Lord, as we make a decision today to choose you, that we may be faithful and endure to the end. Father, we've heard a message today, and Father, I have been, had a message preached to my mind even now. Let there be difference even more, that we should never secure unity for the sake of just uniting on error. Father, let us unite on truth, but Father, we know if we want to be united on truth and to reject things that are error, we must first be enlightened by your word. And Father, we're not just seeking milk, we're seeking the meat of your word in these last days. Father, I just pray that this prayer might be accepted through the righteousness of your son Jesus, through the sweet incense that he offers at that heavenly sanctuary, that we might receive it by faith, trusting his merits, to not only accept this prayer, to accept this consecration, but to also make valid and to make effectual the promise that we have, or the decision we're making now. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.